morning. It's good to see everybody out this morning. It was one of those mornings when it was kind of overcast, and just a little cool, and you could have been tempted to stay in bed. Maybe you were, but you chose to get up anyway and come. We appreciate, we appreciate that. I'm sure God is appreciative of the fact that you're here this morning. If you're a visitor, we especially are grateful for your presence. If you have some questions about the congregation, Bible questions, uh, please feel free to ask. We'll be happy to sit down with you and answer those questions. If you have a Bible, turn over to Matthew, the 16th chapter. In chapter 16, beginning in verse 21, Jesus tells his disciples that he's going to have to go up to Jerusalem, suffer many things, and he's going to die. It was not a very popular message with his disciples, as you can imagine. Peter took him aside, verse 22, and began to rebuke him. <coughs> I don't know if you ever thought about this, but here's Peter rebuking the Lord over something Jesus said. And not just about something Jesus said, but about something that was very important that had to happen if we were to have the hope of eternal life. <coughs> Peter's rebuking basically said, Lord, we can't let that happen. You can't go up to Jerusalem and die. And Peter was, <coughs> excuse me, Peter was fully committed to that. You might remember on the night of Jesus' arrest, it was Peter that took out his sword, cut off the ear of the high priest's servant. It was Peter who said, I'm ready to die with you. And he meant it <coughs> because he took out the sword and was ready to defend Jesus. I'm going to put one of these in my mouth, so hopefully it'll stay a little moister and I'll quit coughing. I'm not like the preacher who used to put one in to time his sermons. Some of you are laughing. He got a hold of a button one morning and liked to never get finished. <laughs> but I promise it was a mint. It was not a button. So here's Jesus saying he has to go up to Jerusalem and die. Peter saying, no, that can't happen. Jesus letting him know if that's the case, he has a serious problem. Get behind me, Satan, verse 23. Peter was doing the work of Satan at that moment. Didn't realize it, of course. But then Jesus says something else that I find very interesting. Look at verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Jesus says, not only must I die, but if you want to be my follower, you need to die. <coughs> you need to lose your life for my sake. What's he mean we have to die? I don't think he's talking literally. But he's talking about figuratively. That life you lived when you were in control of your life, that life has to be put to death. That's that life of fleshly living. It needs to be a life of spiritual living. Turn in your Bibles over to Romans chapter 6. In verse 17... Paul says that the Romans had obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine delivered them. That's the doctrine of the gospel. It's essentially this. Jesus lived, he died, and he was raised again. <coughs> In verse 1 of chapter 6, <coughs> Paul poses the question, Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? <coughs> Went all morning without doing this. God forbid, he says in verse 2, certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer therein? Don't you know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Thank you. He's 
afraid I'll get a button this time. If I... <laughs> now, where was I? <laughs> so many of us as were baptized into his death. We have to die to the fleshly living, to the fleshly desires, to our own way of doing things. And then be raised to walk, verse 4, in newness of life. We are literally buried when we obey the gospel. Buried in baptism. And then resurrected. Raised a new creature. If you ever ask yourself the question, why was it the eunuch rejoiced after he was baptized? Because that's when that new birth took place. That's when the salvation was accomplished. That's when the sins were washed away. But that old person needs to be crucified. He goes on to talk about that in the rest of chapter 6. Verse 7, he says, or verse 6, Knowing this, that the old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. But the point is, we have to die to that old lifestyle. Can't live that way any longer. And that requires a sacrifice. Major sacrifice. You don't get to be in control any longer. Christ does. Of course, before you weren't really in control. Sin was in control. You were a slave to sin, Paul says. Now you're a slave or a servant to Christ. It's a conscious choice people make. Jesus offers it and says, whosoever will, let him come. Many of you, perhaps most of you, maybe all of you this morning have done that. I don't know. You do. But if you've done that, that's good. You know what you have to do as far as that old lifestyle is concerned, but maybe you didn't do it yet. Maybe you've been hesitant because you're just not sure, how can I put this? If it's worth it. You ever been offered a great opportunity? And then the person begins to tell you about all the things you have to do to seize this opportunity. And at some point you have to stop them and say, okay, so what's in it for me? What benefit do I get from this? It's a good question to ask. If you become a Christian, what are the benefits? Well, we know about eternal life, but, you know, that's, somebody described that part of Christianity in this way. That's pie in the sky, in the by and by, when I die. And it's not really a reality right now, is it? Especially if you're younger. You know, younger people think you're going to live forever. We're invincible. Listen, I included myself in the young I was invincible, I thought, at one time. So what's, what do we get when we become Christians? What do we get in this life when we become Christians? I think it's a good question to ask. So let's talk about it just a little bit. Turn over to Matthew chapter 6. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. He asks the question, or he says, verse 25, that we should not worry about our life, what we're going to eat or what we're going to drink or about the body, what we're going to put onto it. Life is more than just what you eat and what you wear. Is that true? Yeah, a whole lot more than that. Somebody made the comment recently I was reading and said, when someone gets near to death, they don't ever say, I wish I had spent more time at the office. They also don't say, gee, I wish I had bought one more set of clothes or had one more meal at a five-star restaurant. Well, I don't know. Some people might say that, but that's a one-time thing, right? Right? 
Why do you worry about these things, Jesus is saying. And he goes on to talk about how the birds of the air, they don't, have, they don't worry about those things. God takes care of them. He, when it comes to being clothed, he talks about the lilies of the field. You ever driven down the interstate and just looked out over a field that nobody's planted, but it's just beautiful with flowers and trees? and Yeah, they're out there. You ever gone through the desert after it rained? I never have, but I've seen the pictures. Nobody planted it. Nobody, no individual human being planted them. God did. Beautiful, gorgeous. If he takes care of deserts, what's he going to do for you? Now look at the promise, verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. If you worry about serving God, he'll take care of your basic needs. He'll see to it that you have food and you have clothing, you have shelter. He's not going to let you run around naked and hungry. Won't happen. If you seek first the kingdom of God, you have his promise of providential care. But not only that, in his providential care, he can take bad situations and bring good from it. As a matter of fact, he might be putting you in that situation so that you can help bring good from it. I'll give you one example from the scriptures. The Jews became so wicked, God had to send them into captivity. He destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel, and then the southern kingdom of Judah didn't learn the lesson, and they went into Babylonian captivity. Daniel, taken as a young man, probably a teenager, 14 to 18 years old, Selected to serve as an advisor to the king, put into training to be that advisor, finds out he's going to be put to death because his trainers can't fulfill the king's promise. Or, I'm sorry, king's request. I would say that's a pretty bad situation. Let's see, I'm going to die, Daniel might have thought, because I was back in Jerusalem... Now I'm a captive, forced to do this, and because those people who are supposed to train me can't do something, I'm going to die? You know the rest of the story. He went to God in prayer along with Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. God answered their prayers, gave Daniel what he needed to fulfill the king's request, and all of a sudden Daniel's elevated in the eyes of the king. And so is God, by the way. And Daniel gets into a position where he can influence things in the kingdom. And so do Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And while they're there for those 70 years, the Jews are learning the lesson God wanted them to learn. And when they went back to their homeland, they never had that particular problem again. Bad situation to be under death sentence for what somebody else has done to you and can't do for you. But look what God did with it. Turned it into an opportunity for Daniel to stand before the king and become a trusted advisor, which then allowed him to influence policy in the kingdom and definitely change the attitude of the people in that kingdom about God and his people. And it continued to be that way throughout the 70 years. We don't know when bad things happen if they're really as bad as we think they are. Because we don't see what's coming later on from them. I've read about people who lost their jobs, thought it was the most devastating thing that could have ever happened to them. And then pretty soon they found a new job and it turned out to be such a great job they were grateful they lost the job and had to look because they weren't looking for another job at the time. We don't know. God takes what looks like bad things and turns them into good things many times. Now, some things I can't answer. But a lot of things, we just have to wait and ask God, what is it that I'm supposed to do here? What's the lesson to be learned? What's the help that you're going to provide? 
He also provides corrective discipline. Turn over to John chapter 15. Verses 1 and 2. I am the vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away and every branch that bears fruit he prunes that it may bear even more fruit. Corrective discipline. Illustrated by grapevines. Uh, we live in a society where we don't do much with grapes, most of us. Every once in a while I'll see a house that has a grape arbor that comes up over one of those, uh, I guess it's an arbor, isn't it? And it provides shade and then when the grapes get ripe you can reach up and pick them and eat them. As long as you watch out for the yellow jackets. But most of us don't do that. But it's a lot like most other crops that you might grow in your garden. I remember my father grew tomatoes, and every once in a while I'd see him out there pulling off parts of the. I'm asking, what are you doing? He said, I'm getting part, rid of the part that's not going to do me any good on that tomato plant. Getting rid of that which is not productive. God does that for us. Sometimes he does it for us as we study the scriptures or we hear a sermon or we're in a Bible class and we realize we've got a problem with something and we correct it. Other times, he does it by helping us to realize this life is not where our future lies. Sometimes we get pretty comfortable in this life. But this life is not the end. We're preparing for another one. A far better one. Sometimes we have to be reminded of that. Because it can be enjoyable at times in this world, can't it? Yeah? Sometimes we get a little too relaxed, a little too comfortable. Maybe, in the words of one preacher one time, he said we get a little too happy in Beulah land. And we don't want to go to paradise. So he lets us have those reminders. You ever wake up in the morning and have a few aches and pains? Maybe you're a little stiff. You ever get a headache? You ever stub your toe? Catch your thumb under the hammer? Hit the wrong nails, one person told me. All reminders that this body is temporary. It's not permanent. Not going to get to live forever. You ever look in the mirror and notice things are starting to sag just a little bit, maybe get a few wrinkles? Or I know not everybody does, but many of us do. Things don't quite... Well, some people can't be as handsome as me, but... <laughs> Joe has a picture on our refrigerator. I think it's from when we were still dating. I was up in my grandmother's house. We were either just married or still dating. I can't remember. I did look a little different back then. It's a reminder this body is aging. And I could go off and I could pay somebody lots of money to surgically correct some of that, but it's not going to change what's really the source of the problem, and that is this body's not designed to live forever. He reminds us of those things. Corrective discipline is the term I would use to describe that. And it's really good for us, isn't it? We do it for our children. Your parents did it for you when you were children. And our children will do it for their children, hopefully, because that's how we learn. He's reminding us. But then there's those eternal blessings. In the scripture reading, those are the words of Paul as he's about to die. Look again at 2 Timothy chapter 4. (laughs) 
Be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry, for I am ready to be poured out as a drink offering, the New King James says. And the time of my departure is at hand. Paul says, I'm about to die. He's going to depart this life. He's in a Roman prison for the second time. First time he was released. This time, according to history, he's going to be beheaded. That was your privilege as a Roman citizen. If you were to be executed, you could be beheaded instead of crucified or some other cruel means of being put to death. But Paul writes, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who love his appearing. Paul, at the end of his life, could face death with the assurance, with the certainty of better things ahead. Because he died to sin. He lost his life so that he might gain it. He gave up that old way of living and took the new way of living. The way of Christ. Lived faithful to God throughout his life. And so at the end of his days he could say he had finished the race. That means he's going to get the laurel wreath of the winner. He talked about that in 1 Corinthians 6. He also says he fought the good fight. He was assured of victory. If you go read the book of Revelation, confusing as parts of it may be, the message is very simple. God and his people win in the end. Paul says, I'm about to win that fight. He's going to get to go be with the Lord. That thing that didn't seem like a reality when Paul was young, because it seems to be the case with all people when they're young, now it's a reality. But he didn't face it with fear. He faced it with confidence because of Christ, because of what Jesus did for him and what he did for Jesus. How about you this morning? Have you lost your life that you might find it? Have you lost your life that you might find it, but somewhere along the way <laughs> you let go of it? Are you in a position this morning where you can say with Paul, should you face your death, I have run the race, I've finished the course, I've fought the good fight, the crown of righteousness is laid up for me that the righteous judge will give me on that day. If not, we stand ready to assist you. If you need to obey the gospel, we'll gladly take your confession of Christ based on your belief and your repentance and immerse you for the remission of your sins. You need the prayers of the church. You need to confess some sin. We're ready to pray with you and for you. If you just need the prayers of the church because the difficulties of life, maybe some of that corrective discipline is getting a little hard to take. We'll gladly pray with you and for you. How do you stand in relationship to that life that Christ offers if we'll simply lose the old life, die to that way of life, if it's not yours this morning, it can be. We stand ready to assist you. But you need to make that decision. We ask you to step out and make it known. We'll do all that we can to help as we stand and sing. Oh, how sweet will be to meet the Lord when he comes in glory by and by. What a song of When he comes in glory by and by, how sweet, how sweet, when he comes in the sky, what joy, what joy, when he comes in glory 
Living by and by, I am longing for that happy day when He comes in glory by and by. For with Him I hope to soar away when He comes in glory by and by. How sweet, how sweet when He comes in the sky. What joy, what joy when He comes in glory by and by. 378, number 378. After this song, we'll be dismissed in prayer. <coughs> Just a few more days to be filled with praise and to tell the old, old story. Then when twilight falls and my Savior calls, I shall go to Him in glory. I'll exchange my cross for a starry crown where the gates swing outward never. At his feet I'll lay every burden down, and with Jesus reign forever. What a joy it will be when I wake to see him for whom my heart is burning. Never more to sigh, never more to die. For that day my heart is yearning. I'll exchange my cross for a starry crown where the gates swing outward never. At his feet I'll lay every Please bow with me. Father in heaven, as we, we bow before you, we thank you, Father, for all that you've given us. Father, we know that you created everything in this world, and you've given us everything that we have. We know it all comes from you, Father, and we are so grateful for everything we have. You get, while you gave us these material things and, and everything else, but you gave us the greatest gift of all of your son, Jesus, your son who came to this earth, who died for us, and who defeated death and was risen. Father, we are so grateful for that. Father, as we go through this life, we struggle. Things happen that we do not understand. But we know, Father, that we can come to you in prayer. And we pray, Father, that you would be with those that we, those that we care about, all those that are listed in our, in our bulletin, those, our loved ones, those, those who could not be with us here this morning, and each of us, for all we all have need, Father. We all struggle in this life, Father, and we, we face temptation. We, when we sin, Father, and we ask for that forgiveness. Father, you gave us this great country in which we live and everything that we have. Father, we are so blessed and so fortunate that we have men and women who are willing to stand up and sacrifice and risk their lives and protect us and that, that separate from their families so that they could, they could serve this nation. We ask, Father, that you would be with our military, be with all of them, and be with Matt, and Amy, and protect them and care for them. Help us, Father, as we go into this, this week, help us to, to have that patience, to, to also to, to look for those opportunities that we have, to encourage others, to, to be the example that you would have us to be. Father, we ask all of this in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.